Hi. Nice to see you folks. Hi y'all. Hi Fran. <laughs> Scroll through a little bit and see if we've got quite a large group here. <coughs> oh. So I'm going to, um, so I guess we'll begin. I think we have a, have a, certainly we have a quorum <laughs> and then some. Um, well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, I'm really um, this director of the South Asia Institute at Columbia. I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to host this celebration of Debushi Mukherjee's new book, um, Bombay Hustle, Making Movies in a Colonial City, which was uh, published by Columbia University Press, um, I guess, late summer, early fall, I think. So I've forgotten the exact date, but um, yeah, I was following it closely. So I'm going to begin by introducing um, Professor Mukherjee and our three guests uh, who are coming from all over to join us. Um, Debushi is assistant professor at Columbia in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies. Um, she and I shared the experience of being fellows at um, Columbia's Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Paris, which um, starting in January, so we both arrived sort of in the middle of the year, had two delightful months, and all of a sudden, and so I really, you know, actually got a chance to, to know you during that time, uh, and then we abruptly were um, cut off by COVID. So um, it, it's sort of this fond bubble memory of experience. Um, uh, Debushi is a film historian and a media theorist working across the fields of production studies, new materialisms, feminist film historiography, post-colonial studies, and South Asian studies. So here, very interdisciplinary orientation. Um, before turning to an academic career, she trained as a filmmaker, and then she worked in uh, Mumbai's film and television industries from 2004 to 2007. And I think that this, it's clear in her book, that this on the ground embodied experience truly animates this book uh, and its core theoretical concerns. Her book presents a practice-oriented history of the consolidation of the Bombay film industry in the 1930s, uh, what she calls a practitioner's eye view. And I think we'll hear a lot more about what that means today. I'm also delighted to welcome three guests for a panel discussion amongst scholars, a uh, very interdisciplinary group of scholars um, whose expertise uh, spans the ele elements of the book. Um, and these elements of the book are also well represented in the title. So I, I would compliment you on your title. So we have expertise in Bombay and its, and its hustle, um, movies and the late colonial. So we have um, uh, William Ellison, uh, Nipa Majumdar and um, Gayan Prakash. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a little introduction of, for each of them now so that we all have a good sense of, of um, what to expect, I think. Um, Nipa Majumdar is Associate Professor of English and Film and Media Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research interests include star studies, film sound, South Asian early cinema, documentary film, and questions of film history and historiography. Her award-winning 2009 book, Wanted, uh, cult wanted, cultured ladies only, Fil female stardom and cinema in India, 1930s to 1950s, charted the rise of the film star in early Indian cinema, mapping out the early culture of cinema stardom in India from its emergence in the silent era to the decade after Indian independence in the mid 20th century. So clearly uh, a core expert uh, to respond to um, uh, Debushi's book. William Ellison uh, is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, he's an ethnographer and historian of religions. Uh, dare I say, part of the trend of 
uh, anthropologists colonizing religion departments, uh, something that I can also, <laughs> I also embody. Um, his 2018 book, The Neighborhood of Gods, The Sacred and the Visible at the Margins of Mumbai, examines how slum residents, tribal people, and members of other marginalized groups use religious images and symbols to mark and settle urban space. So clearly we have uh, expertise on Mumbai, uh, well represented, although he's not our only expert uh, on uh, Mumbai. Gayan Pukash, the Dayton Stockton Professor of History at Princeton, uh, specializes in the history of modern India, focusing on urban modernity, the colonial genealogies of modernity, and problems of post-colonial thought and politics. Until the dissolution of the Subaltern Studies Group in 2008, he was a central member of its editorial collective. Over the past decade, he has led projects examining the spaces of the modern city. And I'm, he's done, of course, numerous books. I'm just gonna mention a, a few recent ones that are the most directly relevant for our discussion today. Um, so he's edited um, a couple of volumes, uh, Noir Urbanisms, Dystopic Images of the Modern City, and a co-edited volume, Utopia, Dystopia, Historical Conditions of Possibility. Uh, and then of his other numerous books, I will note his 2010 book, um, Mumbai Fables, just to give you a sense of his own uh, connections to the city. And uh, his most recent book, Emergency Chronicles, Indira Gandhi and uh, Democracy, Democracy's Turning Point. Um, so with that, um, we will um, begin with a brief introduction by Debushri, and then we will um, have uh, sort of discussion, discussion uh, from our three panelists. And I think the order we're gonna go in is um, William, and then Nipa, and then Gayan. Uh, not the order I just presented their introductions. So please join me somehow in welcoming Teba Shri um, at this exciting publication of her new book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's becoming quite a tradition on uh, Zoom meetings to hold up the book for. But, okay, so well Zoom. represented. <laughs> So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I first want to thank, of course, my very sincerely, uh, Kathy Ewing of the South Asia Institute for coming up with this idea of doing a, a kind of a celebratory book discussion. And I also really want to thank the inimitable Bill Carrick, right, who keeps everything moving at the South Asia Institute at Columbia. And it is such a real honor and a privilege for me to be in conversation today with three thinkers who have for a very long time thought long and hard about the specificities of cinema in India, about Bombay and its many modernities, and the ways in which spatial, affective, and technological histories of media can intervene in familiar narratives of colonialism, nationalism, and the post-colonial condition. So thank you so much, Gyan, Nipa, and William, for taking the time to think uh, with Bombay Hustle. Now, because um, the book has only been out for a, for a very short time, I don't expect anyone here to have read it apart from the panelists. So I will do a little bit of a, a brief introduction. So cinema in the 20th century was a place with a thousand meanings. In early 20th century India, that place could be a large screen in a brick and mortar movie theater. It could be a traveling projector temporarily pitched in a tent or it could be a place that one had heard of from better traveled friends. But more than any of these physical places, cinema was also a pulsating world of practices and practitioners through whom meaning and memory were made. So in Bombay Hustle, I present a practitioner's eye view of filmmaking activity in late colonial Bombay. I focus on a very formative period in the life of the Bombay film industry, the talkie transition of the 1930s, and I think through the multiple simultaneous and incommensurable practices of making, self-making and world-making that cinema strives towards. Cinema in my account exceeds the content on the film screen and embraces a density of embodied techniques that are predicated on a future image 
but that take place long before this final film product reaches a movie theater. I argue that the work of ideating, acting, writing, dancing, stitching, lighting, or simply waiting on the sets in preparation for a shot are equal parts of the history of cinema and should be very central to our understanding of local productions of modernity. The cine worker emerges now as a new social figure in late colonial Bombay, whose experience of the self as worker was an embodied intuition that the modern world is deeply enwrapped with a techno industrial assemblage that is dedicated to creating fictional representations of the world. One of the central arguments of Bombay Hustle is that cinema responded to and shaped urban transformation, not only through on-screen fantasies of modernity, but also through the material presence and the circulation of a varied and a visible cinematic workforce. Cinema's status as the foremost cultural carrier of desire and imagination has to be understood then along both these axes of representation and work. By tracking multiple kinds of film practitioners and different kinds of laboring bodies within an ecology of cinematic practices, we gain new understandings of the conditions of possibility for a local film industry. At the same time, we're also able to revisit some of the key categories of experience that mark our study of the modern. Speculation, newness, freedom, contingency, mass affect, labor power, energy, fatigue, desire, and injury take on specific urgencies and valences when considered in the context of film production in late colonial Bombay city. Many of my conceptual interventions in this book emerged from very pragmatic methodological worries. How do I tell a story of relationalities and individuation that can also accommodate a critique of structural inequalities and resistance. Binaries between structure agency, production reception, body, mind, culture, economy, industry, art, science, magic, human, non-human, and material, immaterial became very vexing stumbling blocks because they weren't really allowing me to narrate the complexities, the contradictions, and the very surprising fluidities of the practices that I was studying. Drawing on theories of embodiment, the processual, relationality, new materialisms, and distributed agency, I have tried to always begin with description as the route to theorization, which is how I have arrived at what I will hope will be some productive reconceptualizations of terms such as exhaustion, waiting, energy, innovation, even reflexivity, by grounding them in the body and in embodied experience of time. The work of feminist and queer historians has been critical to my mind, and through them I have tried to interrogate the politics of archival absence, of the differentiated depletion of bodies, and submerged or illegible forms of refusal. So by way of illustration, I'll just take up a word from the book's title, Hustle. To hustle means to move swiftly and hurriedly, or to compel another to move rapidly, to jostle and push. So starting with this very basic dictionary definition, hustle starts to do a lot of conceptual work for me in thinking the labors of the working body and the labors of the desiring self. It also allows me to move across historiographic scales as you see in the two parts of the book. So the first half of the book is titled Elasticity, Infrastructural Maneuvers, and the second half is titled Energy, Intimate Struggles. Hustle is a form of speculative action, a risky gamble on the future from a site of immediate precarity. So if in part one, we look at industrial hustles to raise speculative finance and to craft a performative facade of organizational respectability, in part two, I look at the desperate hustling by strugglers, stunt workers, and extras who are embedded in multiple precarities of class, caste, and gen gender. Hustle is also a practice of the imagination. And I've explicitly positioned this as a book that is about the material production of imaginations, projections and speculations, gambits and fantasies that sustained a world of viewers and makers in their shared journey through modernity. The making of fiction films involves the invention of stories to be filmed, as well as stories told by practitioners to other practitioners and themselves 
in order to maintain and perpetuate a speculative enterprise. So through a history of cinema and its practitioners, we start to understand the many stories that constitute the everyday and the real. And some of these stories include creativity as consciousness, production as progress, accident as exception. What these narratives signify for all material purposes is that the hustle goes on. And with that, I will stop. Um, and yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much uh, for that. I think it was an extremely concise um, and pithy uh, characterization. Um, so I think we will turn, what did I say? We would turn to um, William next, is that correct? My memory is very short. Yeah, William next. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Kathy and Bill at Columbia. Um, Thank you, Debashree, for writing this extraordinary work. Uh, I feel really fortunate to be up here um, presenting alongside the likes of Nipa Majamdar and Gyan Prakash. And uh, I'm thrilled to see so many old friends uh, in the audience. Um, sometimes Zoom turns out to be good for something. Um, and so I'm going to, to kick off some, you know, not very well uh, ordered thoughts um, by serving up a, a big heaping of praise since um, you just heard from the person at once best qualified to talk about this extraordinary book and worst qualified to speak of it in the glowing terms that uh, it deserves and demands, I would say. Um, this is a, it's, I think, an instant landmark work. Um, it's um, just a, a wonderfully original, uh sophisticated um and it, it's like you know it, it, so nipa majamdar and i uh were talking with devastry in the in the waiting room or the holding pen um before this session launched and nipa kept on saying it's it's like a film i'm tempted to call it a film and um i i don't want to take that insight away from my fellow panelists uh so i'll just stop by saying you know like a really good film it is it's glamorous. This book is full of um, kind of just captivating flash, I would say. It's, it's fancy and it's shiny. Um, and um, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, sexy and fashionable. It's glamorous, uh, but it's also just rock solid. It's, it's a really admirable work of, um, of putting together the results of uh, difficult and wide-ranging and um, um, very thoroughly executed rigorous research and uh, research undertaken uh, across a diverse um, a, a diverse archive or set of archives um, and undertaken in a spirit of uh, methodological innovation. So I just, I, I think it's remarkable. I imagine my co-panelists will uh, concur. Um, and so I'm going to talk, uh, some of what I'm going to talk about is stuff I especially liked and admired. Um, I'll have two kind of, um, I'll identify two areas of kind of comment, critique, uh, invitation to, to questioning. Uh, I'll just put them out there for Debashri to uh, engage however she wants. Um, but uh, sort of by, by way of summing up my little um, prologue of commendation here, uh, I should say that uh, just recently, I mean, seriously, I, I received the contract yesterday. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've begun work on a new book project, which is going to be a concise history um, of the city of Bombay slash Mumbai. Um, I have to reinvent myself as a historian. I'm not quite sure if, you know, the editors who commissioned this book uh, quite understand how, how little uh, training I have uh, as a historian. And I, I, one of my selling points, I think, to the publishers is that um, my view of 
Bombay, as explored in my last book, is of course very cinema-centric. And um, so let me just conclude this little prologue by saying, Debashvi, thank you. You just made my work so much easier. Oh my God, after reading your book, I, I really have fresh confidence uh, in, in undertaking um, my own future book. Um, so, okay, well, having said that, um, let me take the uh, bipartite organization of the book as um, a, a kind of means to unpack some of Debashvi's accomplishment um, in this volume. Uh, Bombay Hustle is divided into two halves. The first half is called Elasticity, colon, uh, Infrastructural Maneuvers. So no sooner do we, we get to you know, the image of structure than we move to dynamic maneuvers, um, mobility, flow, uh, maybe even improvisation. Um, and then part two is called Energy, colon, intimate struggles, which um, on the whole brings the, uh, the inquiry onto a more um, personal, individually focused level, uh, experientially focused level, maybe. Um, throughout this uh, book um, is, well, it, it, the, the, one of the, the great um, conceptual frames that Devashri introduces is that of the Sinna ecology. Um, we're looking at rhizomes here rather than trees, at dynamic webs of relations rather than structures. Uh, as she says at some uh, point sort of further on in the book, ontogenesis rather than ontology. Yeah, and so throughout the picture is, is one of um, sort of shifting co and, and contingent um, engagements. Um, part of what I found very provocative, uh, again, methodologically and uh, theoretically innovative in this treatment um, is what it tells us about bodily experience, um, habitus, materiality, precarity, on all these counts, I think, uh, you know, and, and she has some very interesting things to say in her introduction where she locates herself analytically and theoretically uh, about the kinds of resources she's consulting, the kinds of research she did and the kinds of theories she's looking to, to pull it all together. She says, you know, this is, this is a work of history. This is about the 1930s. Um, it doesn't involve ethnographic field work. And yet in spirit, um, much of her engagement with uh, these materials is animated by, we could say an ethnographic imagination, I think. And I just want to say that, um, you know, in connection with, uh, with, with um, these areas of interest, uh, again, um, bodily experience, habitus, um, precarity, and so on, um, I see this work as very much in conversation, you know, um, with a kind of uh, emerging body of ethnographic literature on Bombay that is advancing the anthropology of affect. And uh, here I would say, you know, my, my own book from 2018, um, recent works by the likes of Svati Shah, Maura Finkelstein, Lisa Bjorkman, Jonathan Shapiro, Anjaria, uh, and uh, kind of at a, a more theoretical level, um, William Mazzarella. Um, so this this goes on the um, the bookshelf um, of kind of people scholars thinking about Bombay as a city of uh, of feeling, uh, of impression, of experience, um, and of course of of dreams, and you know. Um, of unconscious, uh, of affect that's, that, that travels through the, uh, through the unconscious. Um, so let's see. Um, I think I should probably move on to the, the kind of two broad areas of inquiry. Um, one is that I, I just like uh, within the, um, the, milieu of this forum to invite the author to talk about uh, colonialism. Um, you know, the book is titled, uh, or the, the subcolonic is 
making movies in a colonial city. Um, and I guess I, I, I just like to hear more about what marks out Bombay as a center of cinematic production in this period from places like, let's say, uh, Tokyo or Mexico City. Um, and I, I'd like to know more, uh, maybe especially, um, this is, you know, uh, please Debashri address this however you want to, um, but my own um, thinking had to do with uh, ideologies uh, of the 1930s current in Bombay and elsewhere in India, and not only from the, the point of view of the uh, colonial Raj, which after all in Bombay, you know, ran a, a censorship board that um, um, that saw through one of the more draconian censorship regimes I can think of, um, but also uh, I wonder if um, there are interesting things to be said about um, Gandhian ideology and the thoroughgoing mistrust um, of uh, not only the, the kind of um, apparatus of industrial modernity, the industrial technology that uh, of, of which um, you know you eloquently and imaginatively um, map out uh, cinema as as part of um, this kind of industrial uh, modernity. Um, Sorry, where was I? So Gandhi, of course, uh, has his problems with this and Gandhians have their problems specifically with cinema. Um, and um, I think I'm probably violating my own uh, outline here, but in this connection, it just um, it comes to my mind to connect this up with your wonderful discussion of uh, vitality, flows of vitality, um, enervation in the sense of, you know, becoming depleted of energy. This is the only uh, book, I, I think this is the only book I've ever read with, um, a, that, that takes up the question of exhaustion and fatigue um, and, and uh, theorizes it in this extraordinarily uh, compelling discussion. Um, Gandhi thought that watching movies would make you weak, <laughs> you know, and and this uh, plugs into broader uh, Indian discourses. Um, I'm thinking, of, for example, uh, Joseph Alter's work on wrestlers, um, Ayurvedic discourses, discourses about vitality and uh, virility, um, and so we we read a lot about. Um, movie viewing and what I, this is not at all Debashree's language, but what I would think of in terms of interpolation, moments of address, uh, subjectific subjectification uh, in cinema, we, we hear about kind of generating affective intensities and making people more vigorous, more modern, stronger through cinema. But of course, in this period, uh, in this milieu, you have lots of people saying, don't go to the movies, it's going to make you weak, it'll compromise your nature, <laughs> right? So I didn't actually mean to ask that question, but I, I just asked that question. Um, the, the second sort of broad area uh, of, um, of inquiry that I'd like to flag here, possibly for further discussion, um, has to do with uh, with address, um, with cinematic address, with the flow of energy. Um, I'm sorry, I, I already uh, discussed uh, enervation, um, making, you know, making you tired. Um, Debashri does has this wonderful discussion of innervation um, and uh, connects it up with a, a terrific um, idea um, that she takes from Anand Kumaraswamy, um, of all people, the Pali term Sanvega. I, I, that was just one of my uh, favorite points in the book. Um, but okay, problematizing the, the inflow uh, or the generation of energy, um, the um, invigoration 
of modern subjects uh, through cinema. Um, and I, I guess, you know, since I'm on this panel playing ethnographer, um, I want to see if there are ways to connect that up with the way that some of my interlocutors in poorer neighborhoods in Bombay uh, visualize things in terms of flows. Um, I'm thinking, uh, you know, and come to think of it, this is also, this is ethnographic, not just because, uh, not just because my interlocutors tend to talk in this way, but it's probably also ethnographic because I was trained at Chicago and this is kind of an ethno-sociological take on things. Um, I'm thinking of flows of things like uh, energy, uh, power, takat, shakti, uh, alongside what may seem like more quotidian or, you know, uh, more obviously material uh, quantities like water uh, or like light, electricity. Uh, and finally, I, I would add yet another quantity that may flow through networks. And uh, importantly, flows more to certain kinds of people than to other kinds of people. In fact, your access to an unimpeded flow or a reliable flow of izzat or respect or recognition from other people, uh, recognition of your personhood, of your ability, of your agency, of your, your uh, ability to act uh, within society, that marks apart certain kinds of people from certain other kinds of people, I think. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering about uh, placing cinematic address um, within this kind of uh, the idea of the network of flows that, you know, perhaps um, uh, is, is a legacy of uh, ethno-sociological thinking um, in the ethnography of South Asia. Um, I have the terrible feeling that um, I've talked too long, so I'm going to wrap up here uh, just with one last kind of, let, let's bring it all back around to, you know, extolling what an extraordinary uh, piece of work this book is. Um, I think I'll wrap up uh, by, by noting again the originality of the, uh, the chapter on fatigue um, by noting that uh, I, I saw that and I read it and I thought this must, it, it can only come from somebody who actually has experience of film production work. And of course, as, as you all have, have heard, uh, Debashri worked for uh, quite some time in the Bombay film industry. Um, and, uh, I myself have a year uh, in, you know, a much less exciting film industry. I was helping Japanese film crews make commercials, um, worked for a year as a production assistant, and I've never been as tired in my life. You know, I, I, there, there's something that is so punishing and so physically taxing about film production work, where in the end, you know, like you're supposed to be producing you're, you're making dreams, you're making these sort of gossamer illusions that, you know, um, are, and, and it's, according to some people, it's art, according to other people, it's dreams, and, and you're just busting your hump and waking up at, you know, 4.30 in the morning. But then again, since I'm on the West Coast, I woke up at 4.30 this morning anyway, just to be with you. So that's how I'm going to close out. Um, thank you so much, Deva Shi. Oh. Thank you so much, um, William. Um, we'll turn now to uh, Nipa um, Majumdar. Thank you, Kathy, for your introduction. And thank you, uh, Bill Carrick, for your help in um, getting us set up. And thank you, Devashri, for inviting me to this panel and for involving me in your book uh, in its manuscript stage. It's been an honor. And I can only echo what uh, William has said uh, about the book. It is innovative on so many fronts that I felt um, uh, overwhelmed at the idea of even beginning to represent the book uh, to the audience today. I mean, you really, you, you all have to really read the book uh, to get into the, um, uh, the, the details of um, uh, so many keywords that are, um, a completely um, rethought, um, especially, uh, of course, I come from a cinema and media studies uh, uh, perspective, and um, much of our discipline, I think, is um, 
rethought. Much of uh, the sort of central truisms of our discipline are rethought in this book. Um, uh, it's, I certainly will be teaching it in my um, graduate film theory course courses. Uh, it's also, an, it's not just an innovative book in its uh, theoretical um, interventions, but uh, methodologically, and as somebody who advises graduate students, um, I can't, could not help but uh, also think about um, a certain maturity and a shift that occurs that, uh, it, that was already present in Debushri's writing um, in the manuscript stage, which is that it is not packed with quotations from others. Uh, we, it is, uh, it is, um, it is a book that is her voice and uh, has um, so much to give. So I have, I have to apologize. I have been suffering for many months from terrible eye strain. So I'm going to be reading from paper. <laughs> I also am not going to be able to speak extempore the way William did. Um, I am going to read my comments and I have paper here. I, I hope the paper doesn't rustle too much. It's pretty annoying, but I'm going to read from my uh, paper rather than, than from my screen. So um, what I've done is um, I have uh, basically uh, picked out one thread that I uh, particularly loved in the book, which is, which is essentially the thread of temporality. And I'm just going to um, j dive into it. Uh, methodology, theory, and storytelling are inextricably bound together in Bombay Hustle. It's a book you can dip into for the stories and to meet the large cast of cine workers, or you can linger for a, a specialized cine ecology of Bombay City that the book conjures. And I really want to emphasize how much of a pleasure it is to read this book that uh, as I was saying um, before uh, the audience joined us, I found myself when writing these comments um, uh, by mistake say, writing this film as opposed to this book, partly because of the, um, the feeling of immersion in a world that the experience of reading the book gives you that you also experience with cinema because of the last large cast of characters and because of the, um, excellent storytelling. I mean, um, just, uh, you know, enjoy the book for its storytelling. You can dip into it, but you can also stay with it and uh, work, uh, she, uh, Debushri allows you to work out some of the thought processes that went into this book. You actually, she walks you through that. So um, what the book, uh, what the introduction promises, um, uh, what well, the introduction promises in its elaboration of cine ecology as theory and method is conjured and enacted in the book's chapters that dissolve the boundaries of film and city. For me, one of the uh, most valuable contributions among many of this book is its careful uh, attention to the various temporalities inhabited by those who live in and with cinema including Debashri, who makes an embodied connection back to the world of a century ago. I will pluck out a sentence that I see as a core method in the book. She says on page 36, I think of the image as the material trace of practice rather than as a free floating signifier untethered from the ground in which it was imagined. Um, for me, this is a, a, a way of thinking about the film text not as uh, the place where we begin our discussion, but as the place where we end our discussion or as a place that uh, carries a trace, not of an imagined world, but of the practitioners who, uh, who conjured up this world. Uh, so this practice in turn is future oriented because as she puts it, Quote, the work of ideating, acting, writing, dancing, stitching, lighting, and simply waiting on the sets in preparation for a shot are all predicated on a future image, but take place long before the final film product reaches the screen. So these two sentences for me are the two sides of the coin that this book hinges on and, 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 uh, 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 and sort of demonstrate the way in which she is rethinking cinema for us uh, and also 
are presenting us with a method of um, approaching one's subject. Uh, in Bombay Hustle, this in turn is connected to the goal of presenting, uh, and uh, uh, Devashree mentioned this already, a practitioner's eye view of filmmaking in late colonial Bombay. Um, you know, one has books about practitioners, um, but they are not necessarily practitioners' eye view of filmmaking, acti uh, of filmmaking activity. Um, you know, if, if people are at the center of a film studies oriented book, it's usually the audience or it's the greats, the, the directors, um, the auteurs, the studio bosses. Um, this is a book that, uh, that uh, whose eye is on the ground uh, at the absolute lowest rungs of the hierarchy, all across the hierarchy, uh, vertically, and then spread up, dispersed across those who have um, a very casual uh, and I mean casual in the sense of like a gig economy casual uh, relationship to uh, labor relationship to the to cinema. Um, so it is presenting us with this practitioner's eye view of um, filmmaking activity in late colonial Bombay. All of this is not to say that the book does not linger on images and scenes from films or analyzes them. It absolutely does that but it foregrounds the practitioner of all ranks and, and um, abilities. Methodologically, Devashree's work as historian uh, of this practitioner-centered account is grounded in a brilliant combination of ethnographic practice and archival work, two things that I would have thought are um, at odds. <laughs> uh, the way she does this is by entangling her own life and work stories as a film worker in Bombay, with those of the past. Um, this is not a simple matter of telling stories from her own experience and then going back to you know, the archive. Um, she comes to the archive um, of the Sinner world of 1930s and 40s Bombay with the experience of a direct participant of observer, as she calls herself, in 21st century Mumbai's contemporary cine ecology, um, seeking, as she says, quote, to narrate an intimate account of cinema as lived experience, located as I am almost a century apart from the people and practices I seek. I have reflected on my own firsthand experience of film work as a sensory route into the past, committed to voices from the past that linger in forms and silences that are as much theirs as, as mine, end quote. And the point I take from here is not only that this is a a sensory engagement with the archive, but that it is a political, a deeply political engagement with the archive, that it is a, a early 20th century cine worker looking back at and seeing and bringing to being um, cine workers from a hundred years ago uh, in all their precarity. Um, I have, um, Inserting herself into the narrative at times, she takes the reader into a palimpsestic mode of remembering and misremembering the traces of film production, as we see in the very telling anecdote about searching for the ruins of Bombay Talkies studio, which is um, in the introduction of the book. Devashree performs this entanglement of bodies and practices from the past and present through, and I quote her, the kind of bottom-up uh, material first and disciplinarily heterodox analysis that I prefer. And I think William gave us a really good sense of just how heterodox uh, the work is. Um, fittingly, as a practitioner, as a film practitioner turned scholar, Devashri describes the structure of the book in cinematic terms, offering a wide angle view of the infrastructural practices of Bombay cine ecology in the first part of the book and a close up in part two of cine workers and individuals in spaces of the city that are quote, activated by their quote, practices of making, waiting or desiring, end quote. Similarly, she describes her, uh, her archival method as quote, one that follows the logic of cross cutting or parallel editing where she places side by side seemingly disconnected archival fragments. Here again, we see uh, both theory and method um, inextricably linked. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, 
exemplary uh, for us uh, as a way of engaging with the with the archive and bringing uh, materials of the archive to the fore. Every photograph, diagram, map, and drawing in the book is pre present in a montage-like relation to the words on the page, sometimes directly addressed at, the, at other times offering another layer of meaning. This archival co conjugation, as she calls it, as she calls her method, uh, and more about this later, sits well with her cine ecology as method as both are based on understanding the cinema as provisional and speculative assemblages connecting bodies, materials, and energies. To return to temporality as a modality of analysis in this book, a brilliant discussion of futurity runs through its pages, encompassed both by her brilliant chapter on cotton market speculation and futures trading, and by her conceptualization of the cinema itself. Um, and I indicated some of this in that first quote about um, the, the cinematic image being um, actualized or waited upon by the practitioners. Speculation extends beyond its narrower financial meaning in futures trading and risk management to offer an approach to the archive. The photograph that opens the book, for example, illustrates this approach, which is both speculative and rigorous at the same time, peering into the photo for clues into a life world, but ultimately letting the image speak on its own terms. Futurity is entangled in uh, the major, uh, a major keyword of the book, speculation. With its la Latin root in speculari, or to look at or examine, speculation is closely connected to the hustle in the book's title. Um, both uh, speculation and hustle have the are tinged with the idea of um, the illicit. Um, as Debushri explains, uh, quote, speculative extrapolations permeated Sina ecology in its monetary, infrastructural, technological, and industrial practices, and fil film practitioners wagered daily on their profits, dreams, and lives. Precarity, risk, and danger marked cinema as a space of hustle, and in this, Quotation, you can see how the, the idea of speculation can uh, sort of uh, traverses the entire spectrum from the um, studio infrastructure down to the lowliest cine worker. Further, and this is key, a hustle is a form of speculative action, a gamble on the future from a site of immediate precarity. Um, this is not just uh, an abstract uh, sentence here. This is the the skeletal framework on which the the book is built. Um, the idea of speculative action, a gamble on the future from a site of immediate precarity. In this sentence is uh, embodied the uh, the political uh, commitment that uh, Debussy brings to the book of um, speaking to the. Uh, desires and, and dreams of the cine workers who arrived in the city and lived lives of precarity. But also, as we all know, the absolute precarity of the cinema industry itself. Um, industry, of course, being a word in quotes. So um, speculation and precarity suffuse the book from the infrastructural level down to that of individual lives and bodies, all connected by the promise of success. But Debushri extends ideas of precarity and the instability of cinema into a, con a conceptualization of practice as futurity. When she writes that her focus on practices allows her to quote, highlight the continual coming into being of cinema and its relations with other media, things, and bodies. Even as her work elaborates on the coming into being of cine workers, her acknowledgement of her own embodied experiences in the city allows her to quote, foreground certain resonances between past and present, uh, end quote, so that the life worlds she conjures for us seem in turn, at least to me, to be able to in turn see her or foresee her reality as a cine worker in Mumbai in the 2000s. Um, Debushri's conceptualization of cine workers 
is suffused in futurity through the image of coming into being, both in their own self-imagination and in this book's conjuring of them from archival uh, sources. The sinner worker arrived in the city and as she puts it, quote, crafted fresh imaginations of who they were and what they could be in the process coming into being as a new historical figure. Their coming into being uh, uh, or into a future always in the making is one definition of practice that the book offers. She writes, quote, practice is repetitive, activating, oriented to a future. In practicing her craft, the actress shows her as continually, shows herself as continually becoming actress, end quote. So futurity is ultimately both process and potentiality. We see this in the chapter of, on the coming into being of three studios, Sagar, Ranjit, and Bombay Talkies, as well as in the chapters on actresses and other cine, cine workers. She writes, in this book, you will meet the singing stars, the singing star, the freelance director, the background dancer, the film financier, each at once a historical actor and an unfolding category of work. By showing them inhabiting a position within the cine ecology, uh, Debashri brings into being and visibility different categories of work. Another category of the temporal uh, and of duration uh, uh, is waiting. Uh, which is a, another concept that the book sits with. with it, it's another one of my favorite aspects of the book. Waiting and process also have something to do with both the methods and the content of this book. Whether it's about questioning the idea of the techno aesthetic time lag in the colonies, or it's about the inherently gendered risk of waiting outside rather than inside the studio, or it's about the kind of financially devastating waiting that horizontal integrate, uh, integration sought to remedy. On the one hand, there's waiting fleshed out in the final chapter of the book, uh, uh, which is about the um, precarious sinner worker leaving the place of work late at night, look, waiting for transportation. But on the other hand, there's what she describes as, quote, the temporal tyranny of production turnovers and the resulting imperative that the studio may not remain idle that she discusses in chapter two. So she offers us the interconnectedness between these two modes of temporality, of waiting and of the urgency of process through an extended discussion of waiting in the final chapter of the book, where waiting circles back to the violently gendered precarity of the extra waiting late at night to get home. Um, moving between the ind individual cine workers waiting and the collective struggle of waiting that characterizes labor organizing, the final chapter understands waiting as future oriented labor. She writes, quote, a critical aspect of the struggle and its particular temporality is the practice of waiting. Wait waiting is not passiv passivity, it is a specific kind of labor. End quote. Futurity, waiting, process, arrival, potentiality, coming into being. These are all familiar feeling. These are also familiar feelings and experiences of anyone who has written a book. <laughs> um, what's unusual about this book is that the author takes you along for the ride, making the archival discoveries, the waiting and the rethinking of concepts. For example, why ecology and not systems or industries very much part of the book's method and argument. Locating herself in both the archive and the city offers us, the readers of the book, an affective and embodied experience of Bombay as a cinema city. Alongside the intellectual labor of carefully unfolding cine ecology as both theory and method for us, the writing performs and enacts for us the juxtapositions and imaginative speculations that pull materials and bodies from a profuse wealth of sources. One of my favorite manifestations of the, the kinds of assemblages she puts together are the three network maps in chapter two. I just want to show you, um, I don't know if you can see um, the network map at the bottom of this page. I have no idea if you can see it. It's unfortunately really tiny and it does strain your eyes. She has three, now. this is the Dobombe you can see the network map, I think. This is the one for Bombay Talkies. Um, I just want to say a few words about it. Uh, these um, 
network maps. Uh, she shows us uh, in these three network maps in chapter two, she shows us how people involved in the three studios were connected through work, sites, and personal relations to other markets, studios, personages, and relationships. Uh, my only regret is that these maps are so tiny, it's all, you really need a magnifying glass to enjoy them. <laughs> Uh, through the map, we see, for example, how Ranjit Movie Tone was con connected to bullion, cotton, real estate, and the stock market, visually embedding cinema in the wider ecology of the city's volatile financial systems. It also demonstrates a point she makes later in the book that, quote, at the heart of the cine ecology lay the intractability of the social, which could not be controlled by science, technology, or rationalization, end quote. And this intractability of the social, of relationships that come and go, that are ephemeral, I think that's the heart of the cine ecology that you experience when you read this book. Rather than bemoaning the absence of a rationalized studio system, she proposes, quote, a historiographic reframing of financial lack uh, which we hear about endlessly in Indian cinema study. Uh, so a historiographic reframing of financial lack as an opportunity that created the very conditions of possibility for a resoundingly decentralized, diverse, and dynamic cine ecology that drew on alternative sources of finance and survived several economic, social, and political challenges through the decades. So the network maps visualize for us what she describes in the introduction as, quote, the rhizomatic nature of the cine ecology, wherein multiple intensities are constantly on the move, joining and recombining in different assemblages to sometimes produce coherent zones of emergence or nodes of production named studios. Uh, I, I, I think of this as such a... Can I just um, intervene yes. to... Just maybe you should um, wrap up. Wrap so up. That, like, so, to... Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm done. This is my last page. Um, great. So the the um, this this reframing of studios as coming into being this ephemeral mat uh, uh, the, of the ephemerality uh, of the studio uh, coincides with the ephemeral ephemerality of the archive as well, um, and cine ecology as both method and concept helps retain the language of precarity and futurity. Um, uh, captured, uh, sorry, by the idea of temporality, uh, of temporarily coherent zones of emergence. As method, it allows for juxtaposition of archival materials, and as theory, it offers a conceptual tool to visualize and experience relationality among bodies, sites, infrastructures, desires, energies, and temporalities. As she puts it, uh, the term cine ecology describes a material reality as well as a method for processual and non-dualist approach to cinema. And I offer it as a provisional analytical tool, tool rather than a grand system of explanation. Um, if spatialized juxtaposition is the method by which the elements of cine ecology of the 1930s and 40s archive are brought together, it's a temporalized conjugation that brings Debashree's present together with the past she's conjuring for us. She says, I'm quite conscious of my location in the present and its urgencies and also aware that one can never fully capture the ephemerality of practice. But I choose conjugation as a reflexive method committed to the libidinal coupling of texts, images, data, and memories. And uh, so I want to end with conjugation with its grammatical inf inflection alongside its conjugal resonance to say that Bombay Hustle, in Bombay Hustle, Debashri has written a love letter to her fellow workers and to the city of bon Bombay, a letter that entices us to similarly fall in love with it. Great, thank you so much for this um, uh, really in-depth analytic overview of the book. I think our audience, even if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, has a you know, really uh, vivid sense of, of um, what the book is about. Um, so let, let us turn now to um, Gael and hear your um, thoughts. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and um, <clears throat> to celebrate uh, Debushree's Bombay Hustle. 
And it's also great to be following William and Nipa because they've already offered very uh, focused uh, reflections on the book. So my job is actually easier and I can be light. Um, it is a fabulous book. Um, and, but Debushi, you know that already from my blurb uh, that I think very highly of the book. Um, but reading it, I was reminded of actually the first time I met Debushri, uh, and that was in Bombay when she was working in films. She was deep into it as a practitioner. And I've been aware since then how, you know, Debushri moved from uh, working in films to working in Osayan and then JNU and then NYU and then finally arriving at Columbia. So it's been uh, a journey and I was just thinking of this uh, itinerary that, you know, you followed. Um, and I think of that itinerary as a leading up to a book um, as a significant accomplishment, which must be satisfying to you. Um, writing and publishing a book um, is a strange thing. It's a process of placing your own personal intellectual discovery and journey out into the public. Um, so it is a, a milestone, a, a sense of completion, um, a way of placing your labor for public consumption and discussion. Um, and it is, I mean, I think of it as an emotional and affective uh, point. Uh, so as I read your book, um, uh, I mean, I'm already very fond of you, uh, but as I read your book, I became even fonder uh, and really felt with you in a way, um, a sense of uh, completion of at least one particular intellectual you know, journey. As I read your book, uh, I could identify this journey, not only because you mention it uh, as a practitioner, you were there in the book throughout, uh, but it is also, as many of uh, previous people have mentioned, uh, it is an essential part of your methodology. Not in a sense of, you know, kind of a tell-all, you know, uh, revealing the entrails of the Bombay film industry. Although I did enjoy uh, reading about Shah Rukh Khan tapping on your shoulder. Um, but that experience uh, frames the book's uh, theoretical orientation. And much of what I have to say, you know, relates to that. But before I get into that, um, I want to mention one among many sort of highlights of the book. And this is the captivating account of Shanta Apte, the Marathi actress in the 1930s. Uh, in later chapters, De Devashri uh, delves into her little known uh, Marathi memoir to give us a, a fascinating account of the film industry as a site of labor, uh, exploitation, depletion of the body, uh, and struggle. Uh, we get a really uh, astute account of uh, the Bombay film industry in relation to capitalist modernity. And she provides us a vivid portrait of what film labor meant as an expression of uh, Bombay's capitalist modernity. And that account alone, in my view, is worth the price of the book. Uh, but there are many other things uh, going for it. So let me just turn to just two broad points that I want to uh, identify and both William and uh, Nipa have referred to it. Um, I, I wanna get to it in a slightly different way. So I'm not a film scholar. So I cannot speak of the book's intervention in the field of cinema and media studies. But speaking as an urban historian and having written a book on, on Bombay, and dabbled in films, uh, I can say something about it in relation to city and cinema. And this has to do with uh, the analytic lens of what Devashree calls 
Sine Ecology. By Sine Ecology, Devishri refers to the frame beyond the screen, leading to the city, its capitalist history, labor, class, caste, gender, politics, a whole host of things. And we see the film, um, uh, or films fully embedded in this uh, larger ecology. And this is important. Uh, in fact, when I was researching my uh, book, Mumbai Fables, I was aware of this relationship between the city and cinema. You know, I'd read literature on how, for example, you know, moving through uh, the city and you saw the city through the window frame of a car, it was like a camera, you know. So there were various kinds of relationship that, you know, people had made between uh, city and cinema. I sort of knew intuitively that, you know, there was a larger relation beyond the image uh, between city and cinema. And this came uh, home to me one day, and just a little anecdote. Um, I had met a TV producer, uh, a director in, in Bombay who invited me to a shoot. And the shoot was in East Andheri. I reached there in the evening, there was, of course, no shooting going on, but people were milling about. There were junior artists, there were light boys, there was a cameraman, assistant directors, people like you. Um, but the director was missing. Uh, and apparently the shoot had been canceled, but no one had actually bothered to tell all these people. So uh, I got talking to them and, you know, they asked me why I was there and, you know, I told them my, of my interest. And since I guess they had nothing else to do, um, they told me story after story about their personal backgrounds, where they came from, their lives in the city, their struggles to you know, pay their bills in light of this uh, unpredictable em un uh, employment conditions. They were working one day, not working another day. Um, the nature of the industry, their hopes and aspirations, and speaking to them reminded me the truth of what, you know, Jonathan Rabin says in his book, Soft City. Um, and I'm paraphrasing him. He says that the soft city of imaginations, aspirations, myths, hopes, dreams, and nightmares is as real, if not more real, than the hard city of demography and statistics. The beauty of uh, your book is that it actually navigates between that soft city and hard city. I sort of knew of this, as I said, intuitively in writing my book, but your book really provides an analytic lens uh, and a methodology to understand and theorize this relationship between the city and cinema. Uh, it shows that, you know, affect and political economy are vitally connected. In fact, this relationship defines the movies. So I find the analytic lens of cine ecology in Bombay Hassel to be a major intervention, not uh, only in cinema studies um, and not only about image and narrative, but in urban history, uh, showing that image making and city making go hand in hand and that urban history uh, that the urban history of bombay is also its history of cinema the the second um, part that i want to highlight is of course the part of your title hustle and hustle not only invokes energy and movement but also blurs into overreaching, hyperbole, speculation, tall stories, uh, or, you know, what uh, Trump calls uh, truthful hyperbole, um, making things up. Uh, let me again uh, tell you an anecdote, anecdote to illustrate this. When I was in Bombay, you know, and I was talking to people associated with with my kind of a long struggle to get Bombay Velvet made, um, you know, people would often say, 
सर इट विल हैपन टुमारो कल हो जाएगा एंड नॉट ओनली इन फिल्म यू नो पीप यू नो रियल एस्टेट एजेंट अदर पीपल से इन फिफ्टीन मिनट्स आई एम आई सी यू इन लाइक फाइव मिनट्स यू एन बैंड्रा आई मीन ही इज इन अंधेरी he is not going to be there for another 2 hours but i mean that was the kind of a mood uh, and of course 15 minutes would pass and stretch into hours uh, tomorrow would stretch into weeks and months um, and then i you know i began to think that you know people in bombay just lie um that that's the mood of their working um and i mentioned this to someone who was a big shot in hollywood and um, and he said you know it's very much the same in hollywood that i would often be pitched with these film scripts and i would be made to feel that if i didn't take out my checkbook and sign right there and then i would be missing a, a big opportunity so there is a sort of a hustle which is part of the nature of sort of movie industry uh, but what debishri points out um, is the hustle has a particular character in in bombay and that is related to also uh, the speculative capitalism of uh, bombay's cotton market people who finance the films also doubled as cotton traders who were engaged in speculating uh, in, in their trade their investment in films was part of their speculative investment so not only the films unpredictability leads to this kind of uh, speculation and hustle um, it's very connection with the capitalist economy of bombay um, so sort of percolated down uh, to film production and the experience of film work workers you know whose lives were completely sort of unpredictable because of the employment conditions so uh and, and i want to sort of connect this uh aspect of hustle to the nature of uh, what i would say capitalism on the cheap that was built under colonialism and you can see that that for example in the cotton textile industry people who invested capital in the textile industry had to you know invest huge amounts of money in importing uh, machinery and so uh, the only way in which they could turn any profit was to employ um workers at super cheap rates um so and that's why bombay has this uh, you know phenomenon of uh, in immense wealth merchant princes on the one hand living cheek and cheek and cheek by jowl with people in shanty towns that was true also in the mill districts uh, where you had these big factories and and then chawls uh, so that was part of you know you know william raised this question about what is specific about bombay and what is specific colonial about bombay and i think one way in which one can understand the coloniality of uh, bombay's capitalism is in this way in which um, capitalism uh, was practiced it it was built uh, on cheap and speculation and uh take making taking these kind of massive risks um was part of bombay's capitalist industry um so waiting on the set waiting for an opportunity were parts of this whole economy of hustle let me just end by saying that in a way as i was reading the book uh I thought the book itself is an exemplification of a hustle, um, in the sense that you very energetically move between film production, archive, um, memoir, uh, scripts, uh, between movie practitioners and cotton traders. There is a kind of a 
should say frenzied movement uh, between all of these different aspects. So in a way you enact that hustle uh, in the book. And, and I think that is a tribute to you in the sense that your book is, is you. And so that makes me very glad. So congratulations again. The book was a pleasure to read. Um, and I'm fonder of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your comments. And I will now turn it over to Debashree to um, react to this amazing array of reactions. So All I have positive. To, I have to admit that I was quite nervous this morning, <laughs> um, anticipating, not knowing what to anticipate on this panel. And, and now I'm really quite overwhelmed. Um, I mean, I really don't know. I, I really don't know how to respond. I, I mean, thank you so much for reading so carefully. And I'm also actually really grateful uh, that we're also ending with, I mean, each of you also pointed out something that I've been reluctant to name or articulate very clearly, which is my very personal and emotional investment in this book. And this is coming up in every discussion that I'm having about the book with, because the book is also a very solitary journey uh, and, a, and a lot of uh, silence, <laughs> sitting in silence in various dreary uh, rooms and libraries, um, hustling to find a moment to write one paragraph somewhere in the middle of everything else. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really glad to be reminded, right, that, that this is where the book comes from and that I have really a very, very personal and affective stake in this, which also I think as, as Gyan was pointing out, uh, has a certain kind of vulnerability in it. Like I've, I've, I'm presenting my life and my kind of uh, engagements with cinema, exposing it in public in this way. And I like how I think uh, something that Nipa teased out um, along that vein, uh, that what it means to be able to then bring yourself in as a character in a book that is set a hundred years before the moment in which you're writing. Um, and I think for me, one of those, one of the things was also how to think about a sensory uh, experience but also how to kind of avoid a kind of a very straight historicist understanding of the past, present, future, uh, and to think about continuities. And I mean, all of us, as all of us as historians are always writing from our present, our present political and ethical concerns. And there's something that every time I was looking back at a fragment from the archive, I would feel a kind of an embodied sense of surprise or shock And then how to make sense of that. Um, I don't want to, I think, go on for very long in terms of the responses. Um, I do want to say, maybe pick up on one thing because it's also a fun thing that occurred to me. So uh, William talked about what are the ways in which colonialism um, is a real kind of factor, phenomenon, presence. Uh, uh, that's very kind of fundamental to thinking this moment uh, in, in the emergence of a talkie film industry. And one of the things, and I was also listening to actually a very fantastic book discussion yesterday, um, uh, organized by Sesame and Borderlines uh, with Durba Mitra and Andrew Liu. And one of the things that it seems that a lot of us that are writing about colonial pasts in South Asia are feeling is how to narrate that moment and to take seriously the colonial presence um, and its various machinations in a more textured lived kind of a sense. So how to make the story of colonialism in South Asia less familiar. So in that sense, you may not find in the book, the kinds of ways in which we're expecting to see what colonialism looks like in the city, but it's pervading through the entire cine ecology and of course in every chapter. And some of this is, is very directly, um, structural, material in terms of censorship, in terms of a lack of finance available for an indigenous industry that is pretty much forsaken, neglected, because it is only viewed as a potential problem in terms of anti-colonial content. So not really, not that kind of economic surveillance, which also makes it a space of economic opportunity, but also the kind of binaries, binaries that are so fundamental to the epistemes of colonial modernity 
are also what really shape the film industry and the cine ecology. And in every chapter, I think about what are the ways in which cinema uh, and cinema practitioners are confronting, negotiating, dismantling these boundaries between culture, economy, industry, art, uh, respectability, uh, and so on. So I think in, in those ways, it's also something that really determines that colonialism is a condition uh, and a really the kind of cradle within which uh, this very energetic uh, film form and film industrial activity is taking place. And it informs cinema at many levels in terms of its imaginations, in terms of its impulses, in terms of its conditions of possibility and the conditions of impossibility Right, the impossibilities which then have to be countered through various other creative forms. And about Gandhi, I think I just wanted to read out one um, very interesting song lyric. So there's a film that came out in 1938 called Industrial India, uh, which has a Hindi title Nirala Hindustan, which I discuss a little bit in the in the book. And there's a very interesting song in that, uh, which says. Um, and I'll just read it in Hindi for those who understand and I'll do a quick translation. Ladne walo, karne walo, aapas mein jhagarne walo, talwaare roko, suno suno ek nai baat. Nai baat haan nai baat. Dekho ye firangi aya. Acha bolo firangi kya laya. Rail, tram, motor ye laya. Mazduro ko kaam dilaya. Itna hua. Lekin hum phir bhi bhukhe hain. Haan bhukhe bharat mein lap. to bring the railways, the trams, the motors, and a lot of employment for workers. But still, we still remain hungry. And then the next paragraph says, Doro Doro Gandhi Aye. Gandhi Aye or Gandhi Kya Lai. Right? <laughs> and it says, Charkha Lai, Charkha Lai, Bekaro ko kaam dilaya, Ablao ka jeevan laya, Itna hua lekin hum phir bhi bhuke. So look, on the other hand, Gandhi, Gandhi has arrived. What has he brought? He has brought his charka. He has enabled some kind of self-employment, which has really helped women. But still, we remain hungry. So what is the film's then final <laughs> thesis? That I am hope and I am industry. That there is nothing, there is no way forward without industry. And in many ways, this is not representative of, of the entire kind of ideological range of the practitioners of the Bombay film industry. But there is definitely a kind of overwhelming sense in which some, a, a very kind of, um, uh, those with the maxim, I mean, the kind of major players and the puppet masters of the film industry really are excited by the industrial aspect and are very self-conscious about their engagement with this form as a modern technological industrial form. And that excitement of engaging with this thing um, and it defining the self, then I think is something that I try to um, look at across scale, right? So from the producers, financiers uh, towards the end, um, and just one quick thing about futurity, which I'm really grateful that uh, Nipa brought out the question of temporality. Also want to be very clear that the reason I focus so much on struggle, on waiting, on hustle, is because I'm trying to think futurity as speculation and as many post-colonial and I think decolonial scholars are thinking that, that must one always think speculation as rapacious activity? Is there a way to kind of recuperate some other uh, 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 political potentialities from speculation. So futurity also, and I, and, I, and, I, and I draw on Donna Haraway at a particular moment, that futurity understood not in the sense of um, an escape into a kind of a future a vision where some miraculous thing like God or technology will save us from planetary destruction, for example, right? Or a sense of resignation that the future is inevitable, but thinking futurity with these practitioners from a place of precarity, where a future orientedness is actually embodied and grounded in, in an engagement with the present, a present as the grounds that have to be prepared for a future time that will come, right? To prepare yourself for the future. So very different kind of a sense in which um, I'm trying to think futurity here. 
uh, and I'll stop here in case there are more questions and then I can, I can continue to come back to all the very rich um, discussion that the three of you have generated. Great, thanks. Um, I, I just want to mention, because I'm sure I'll forget it later, that I wish, I know we're, not, we're open for questions, but I really wish we could um, wrap it up with celebrating the champagne in this time and, and just all get, oh, you know, really relaxing and talking one-on-one uh, -on -one about uh, some of these issues. But since we can't do that, I, I do want to open it up um, to questions, thoughts, reactions. Um, Bill, are you going to navigate the, the um, questions? Okay, well, um, let's figure out the mechanics of this. Is, um, so I guess, is, do people know of the hand raising function? And hopefully I will be, be able to see the hands. So. so I see one hand already from Akil Bilgrami. Okay, thanks. Are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Devashi, thanks a lot for those very interesting remarks, uh, especially um, I'm stimulated by the things you said at the very end about the future, futurity, as you said. And I wanted to put a question to you and to urban historians like Gyan and, and the others on this panel who've written on Bombay. Uh, you know, if you read a lot of urban sociologists uh, in recent years, uh, they point out that there's an enormous amount of, uh, right, there's a standard discussion of, of all the familiar things like migration from the countryside into the cities. And, and they all seem to, to agree that there's very little reverse migration. That is uh, all the standard uh, migration of the, of the you know, centuries really, but uh, focusing on the period that uh, you're talking about, Devashri, which is, uh, for a decade or decade and a half, uh, 30s and early 40s. So there's all this migration, there's very little reverse migration. And a lot of that has to do with just the kinds of things that Debussy was, uh, was telling us about, which is hope and, and an optimism about the city being the future and, uh, and so on. So, uh, and you know, many of these sociologists say that it's often quite irrational because the conditions in which they live in the city are far worse. So I was reading about Managua recently and, and they said they never go back, even though they're much worse off in, in the cities and the slums and so on than they were in the countryside. So there's just a psychology of optimism, even in the face of, of you know, uh, even if it's often irrational hope and optimism. So there is that psychology, but, but I was wondering to what extent and how cinema feeds into this, to what extent is this really an optimism and hope about future generations? That is, the, the concept of hustle and so on, on struggle will be our struggle so as, so our children and grandchildren will not have struggled. So when we talk of the temporality that both you and Gyan and others talked about and, and Timira also talked about, if it's intergenerational, if you're actually talking about future generations, then is there some idea that the hustle is ours mm -hmm. with a view to having no, no hustle for the future generations? Is, mm -hmm. is, is that something that cinema itself speaks to and, and this futurity that Devashi is talking about mm -hmm. addresses at all? Mm -hmm. Can I say something about this? Yes, please go ahead. So, um, Akhil, nice to see you. Uh, but, but, you know, I was thinking of, uh, particularly in relation to Bombay, um, there's always been this kind of paradox that many of people who work in the film industry, you know, there's all these kind of stories about living on the footpath, but dreaming big. So what is it about Bombay that produces this kind of uh, natural life of struggle, but really big dreams? Uh, and I was thinking of, uh, you know, Marshall Berman's book, uh, All That Is Solid Melts Into uh, Air. Uh, and if you forget the kind of a diffusionist 
idea of modernity he has. But the, his chapter on St. Petersburg, he, he makes a very, I think, interesting point that you have people like, you know, Dostoevsky, Gogol, and so on, who walk on the streets and they imagine um, the kind of urban freedom that they've read about in Paris and other places. But that's not possible in Tsarist Russia. And so you get this kind of flight of imagination where in their fantasies, they live that imagined freedom. And I was thinking the same way in, in Bombay, there is, you know, uh, a, a kind of an overdeveloped sense of imagination and possibility and what it could have. And just turning to the question of uh, migrants, I was thinking of the film, uh, Muzaffar Ali's uh, Gaman, where, you know, Farooq Sheikh character comes from UP to Bombay and, you know, a life of hard knocks and alienation, his best friend dies. Um, and at the end of the film, he goes to the train station and is about to take the train, and, but then he doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, because Bombay is now home. Uh, and to live there, he would, you know, use all the resources of friendship, uh, survival, you know, whatever it takes, but will live in uh, Bombay. And so he doesn't go back to UP. Uh, and I think that's a very telling moment in the film. Yeah, but see, the question, I'm, the question I'm asking both you and Devashree is, is, is it really very much filtered through the idea of the struggle being ours, but, but the future generation, so that the future generation doesn't have to hustle? Right, so, so I'm really asking how much the hustle is just for us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our generation, we who have come here, but with a view to, to a future in which our children don't have. So the, the generational thing didn't come through in your discussion, and I'm, I'm really just alerting you to that. Uh, I, I'm just asking. Uh, if I can just um, uh, think, think with you, Akhil and Gyan over here. I think there's two, two levels at which this question of the past, present and future, I think are really operating vis-a-vis -vis Bombay. So at one level, the question of the struggle is ours, is very much alive and present uh, within the film ecology, thinking specifically in terms of that this is a late colonial moment, right? Independence is on the horizon. And so this is really the 1930s and 40s. So, so this is, there is that optimism about a future, but there is also a sense that we, we should be able to position film, not just as a Swadeshi industry, right? That can, that can be this indigenous, like money-making route to a financial independence for future generations, but also that cinema has a very cultural, political and affective role to play in activating images of past struggles of our ancestors, that will, that will propel us into an independent future. So there's a lot of an investment across historical films, social films, modern films, in thinking that, that cinema has a very crucial aesthetic um, and political role to play in then helping us to make that final leap um, uh, into political independence. But the thing I also want to mention in terms of why do people stay? Why do they stay in the struggle in, in, in that sense, right? Is there's also something more than, um, in, a, in a way it's connected to why a taxi driver, and we've seen this with Bihar right now, right? That people are returning to these, uh, to these cities that it took them arduous days and days of walking to leave. But they're returning A, because there is no choice. But B, because in terms of media industries, I think it's very, very important to think about a certain way in which one can theorize in the contemporary, the production of new, young, precarious, a different kind of a, of a new kind of precaritization of creative work, hinged on the idea that one can internalize a self, the idea of the self as artist, the self as a creative producer, which will then be in opposition to the old fashioned ideas and the previous generation's ideas that jobs mean security, mean pensions, mean retirement funds, mean health insurance. So there's a way in which there is a kind of a, a, a push towards creating an idea 
in the in creative media industries of art and the artist as someone who's beyond these kinds of necessities of the material and that is something that is not a specific to 2020 that is something that we have seen since the turn of the 20th century with this idea of the modern self as artist right surviving on bread and, and oranges and what have you so i think this is also a useful way to think um, that this is also part of certain constructs of capitalist modernity uh, especially with thinking about art and the self as artist as something that's oppositional to an imagination that the body needs care, that the self needs sustenance, that the future might need to have some security. Um, we have a question from Parto Chatterjee. Um, you wanna go ahead, Parto? And then, and then before, sorry, before, um, uh, Jan has to leave in about 10 minutes. So I think we will, uh, and, and we're actually scheduled only to go until uh, 11.45. So I think we'll wrap it up at um, mm -hmm. probably around 11.50 or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Devushri, first of all, congratulations on the book, which I haven't actually seen physically, but I soon will. But as you know, uh, courtesy Devushri, I have a good sense of, of what's inside the book because I've seen various drafts of chapters. Uh, but the question I have, particularly from the discussion that we are having today, uh, is, is that the book uh, appears to be very much a view from inside Bombay. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an insider's, first of all, you have located yourself as, a, as an insider. It's, it's an inside view of the Bombay film industry and what goes on inside. Uh, how, for instance, it, it, it produces what it produces. Uh, but of course, you know, Bombay films were not made for a Bombay audience. So there was this huge audience outside. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what does the, this kind of um, insider's view of the industry say about the image uh, broadly speaking, the image mm -hmm. of Bombay as produced in, in the rest of the country. And of course, after independence, it's not just the rest of the country, you know, there's even outside India, you have. So that's the kind of question. It, is, it, is it the sense of Bombay as a city of the future, Bombay as a city of hope, where people would aspire to go because they, have, they could make a future? Uh, and is that necessarily why, or is that connected to the, to the migration of, of labor into Bombay from all parts of India? Uh, what about the other side that you've talked about, which is, which is the fact that a lot of people leave, com leave completely precarious lives, mm -hmm. that in fact they go hungry, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the actual construction of this image mm -hmm. of the city? Mm -hmm. So thank you and, and great to see you, Partho. Uh, yeah. Welcome back to New York. Uh, well, can I just interrupt for a second before you answer? And just to say, we're really not going to have time to take um, too many questions. And I'm, what I'm going to do is ask um, everybody who has a question to um, enter it as a um, question in chat so that at least we have the questions um, and you know maybe after we're we're um, you know you and you'll have them and uh, hopefully we can begin to address them but probably not. Mm -hmm. um, so no, so just very quickly. Um, so I think part of the of the 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 questions that were in, that interested me in this book is how does how does one uh, think about the specificities of the ground from which a cultural product right or a cultural form emerges. So if that ground is Bombay city, but the specificities of, of that place and its relations to other places, right? Definitely. Um, how, do, how do they kind of surface in the cultural techniques, in the organizational forms, and even and in the images that are produced? How does one see that relation? So I'm very much interested then in thinking uh, about how cinema, Bombay cinema, what is its relation to the ground in which it's made? 
But in terms of the huge audiences outside, again, Bombay is a city of migrants. And if one looks at some of the historical actors in the book, they're coming from all different parts of the subcontinent. And they're bringing different linguistic imaginations. They're bringing different kinds of cultural training. They're bringing different ideas of um, what, is, uh, what are the subjects worthy of art, right? That, that, that are necessary to be converted into a new cinematic form. So there is this constant kind of, at, at the realm of aesthetics and imagination, uh, and in terms of what visions for the future uh, are being constructed and crafted in Bombay, in the Bombay film ecology. It's a concoction from all, bringing all these different itineraries and all these different migrations, I think, with it. So that relation between inside and outside is actually, it's, that is part of this idea of what are the constituents of the cine ecology, right? And is there this authentically Bombay person? And all of these people from Lucknow, from Aligarh, from Kashmir, from Goa, um, from Nagpur, from wherever, once they're in, in Bombay, then they're also trying to navigate this new kind of identity that they want to, to own, that we are now Bombay people, or that we are now film people, we're Bombay film people, at the same time that we have these other um, uh, relations. So, and so there is, I think, a very alive and a very kind of dialogic and fluid kind of an exchange between this question of inside and outside, though in some ways, in film journalism, the specificities of other regions become very prominent and pressing at the level of film critical discourse and at the level, again, of speculation about what kind of film product will work where. So there is a lot of characterization of Punjab as some kind of other, where people really love music. And hence, we should make put more songs into our films. There is a lot of uh, othering of, say, Calcutta. And Calcutta journalists saying, oh, we are a more literary culture, but look at the Bombay people. They're not interested in, in naturalistic acting or in a particular kind of look at, you know, so there is a certain kind of sense in which different regions are being constructed as discrete, but that is happening at more of a film critical uh, level rather than in terms of production of imaginations um, and practices. Um, and also just one very quick thing. I'm just looking quickly at uh, Shohini saying, why did you choose Bombay? There were many other colonial cities, Calcutta, Madras. And is it because you were working there, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so the, one of the like, foundational questions in the book is, and actually one foundational assertion in the book is, that there is, no, in this moment that I'm looking at, so starting in the late 1920s, there is no sense of an inevitability that Bombay is going to be the leading production center of the subcontinent. This is a very highly kind of uncertain question and many different film production centers are in the race, right? For kind of capturing a kind of a broad uh, uh, market base and an audience base. So this is far from a settled question. The reason I'm interested in Bombay is yes, of course, not only because I'm, uh, I have a direct kind of an experience of working in the city, but also because there is something very interesting happening in this talky transition moment where Bombay does take over as the leading production center. So my interest is in understanding exactly how and why and what are the conditions that converge in this moment that allow Bombay to overtake Calcutta, Madras, Lahore, Bangalore, uh, Kolhapur, Pune, in some senses. And I'm also trying to dislodge a little bit one of the only explanations that we have so far, which is Bombay cinema chooses Hindi, Urdu, Hindustani, and hence it automatically captures a large base. So I'm adding many other factors to that, uh, that question. Um, thank you, Gyan. I know that you have to leave. It's lovely to see you. And uh, we'll also just wrap up in a second. So yes, and, and for me, ecology showing is also something that's very important as a method because it also, for me, fundamentally undercuts an idea of, of an insularity of Bombay, right? So how to think about the emergence of a particular cultural and industrial form from a particular place, but also think relationally 
about how that firm could not have hmm. letters, other cultural forms, other filmmaking um, priorities. And so the relation between Bombay, Kakara, Madras, Lahore is very, very alive and present in the book as we track practitioners moving across these different uh, cities and as we track practices that are being exchanged, borrowed, mimicked, appropriated from these other locations. Okay, can I just say something? I think uh, William also has to leave, but we also have a couple of um, questions that I think it would be nice to be able to um, address. Um, so I just wanted to give you, a, William, a chance to exit gracefully. Um, and then uh, if, um, Debashree, if you have chance, and, and to thank all of, um, all of you um, for your amazing um, presentations today and, and the, at this exciting time. Um, but let me turn it over. Um, I know that uh, Avnish Mera ha had a um, question. Uh, do you still have that question? And thank you, William. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe ask you for your notes later uh, if you have them. Really lovely talking to you. And thanks for waking up so early. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yes, Avnish, good to see you. Yes, hi. Good to see you as well. Yes, absolutely. I really enjoyed reading the book. And I started typing out a question, but it's taking me too long to, to figure that out. So um, my question was sort of, I, I think Professor uh, Bilgrami kind of talked about this a little bit how sort of the struggle is changing in the Indian film industry right now. And you talked about it a little bit in your epilogue, but with all these kind of streaming platforms coming in, uh, there's this major shift that's happening where more and more content is being made. And it's not just being made in India, in Bombay, but it's being made kind of all over the world. Um, and, and it's being made with a distinctly Indian flavor. You can look at like a show like Indian Matchmaking, for example, that was shot in US and in India, but it's an Indian uh, type of series. So my question is sort of um, kind of using what you've looked at uh, in the time period that you've looked at um, and, and noticing the changes that happened in that time period and how people dealt with those changes. Can we sort of look at that uh, time period in relation to how things are changing today where the city of Bombay is not the center of the film world in India anymore. And the struggle that used to happen is not happening anymore because there are so, more, so many more avenues for, um, for people to, to get to where they want to be. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there's obviously many continuities and many kind of resurgences of all the things, right? Not a kind of a straight line of continuity between the 1930s to 2020, but some kind of cyclical ways in which some practices, some experience have kind of resurfaced. Um, one of the things that was most surprising to me and as, as well as unsurprising to me this summer was that, and I've mentioned this, I think in every, every talk I've done uh, this, this fall, is the whole uh, discussion around the Sushant Singh Rajput uh, suicide and how an entire kind of national discourse completely pivoted to this. We also know that that was also politically orchestrated as a kind of tactic of deflection. But why, what enabled this to become such an imaginatively resonant uh, topic, right? That could really like oh, completely engineer national uh, public debate. And part of it also hinged on the figure of this debutante starlet who becomes this kind of demonic monster, right? And that the entire nation, the so-called <laughs> nation of Arnab Goswami's uh, viewership, really baying for her blood. And for me, what was very, very interesting is that this is, what, this is something that we see, start to see in the 1930s in Bombay. The construction of the idea of the female actress as a starlet and a whole range of social, political anxieties, right? That start to kind of cohere in that body of the film actress. Um, and, a, and a figure for whom in some of my earliest uh, academic writing, the only clues in the archive that are available for me to kind of approach or recuperate the life of the actress is two narratives of scandal 
and controversy because those are the narratives that remain in the historical record right so i will not find often for many smaller film actresses starlets any kind of record in terms of their interviews or their own writings and or any books but i will find them embroiled in court cases right and lots of litigation in police cases and in a lot of insinuation of gossip rumor and scandal around them and their sexual lives so that becomes a very very interesting thing in terms of one of the ways in which one can understand where is it coming from right this great anxiety cohering around this monstrous contagious body of the 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 female actor uh which is both surprising and disappointing at the same time but useful to think historically about where this debate is coming from and then and just sorry just to kind of we might have like with that switch on we might have to pivot to something okay, else yeah. because i also have to sure 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 like no problem. 4 minutes okay sorry um there was another question in the chat i think i think maybe because this was the first chat uh, question that was typed uh, uma uh, looking forward to reading if you something about the early actresses navigating vulnerability me to movement okay so i think i'll i'll respond to this quickly because it makes sense with what i've just said uh so i do think a little bit again also about the question of uh the precarity of the female body uh because i'm looking at questions of precarity struggle and embodied experience of them as um, as they become visible to us or as we can apprehend them as historians along various kinds of vectors uh and then the femaleness uh, or the, the legible femaleness of certain bodies really kind of exacerbate the industrial precarities um of certain cine workers uh and i do look back at a few instances um of a very particular kind of set of pressures on women in the film ecology in the 1930s a because there's is a kind of work that is denigrated so they really don't have a kind of a social status and there's a huge kind of an effort to be able to recuperate uh which for me i will phrase it in a 21st century language the right of women to work in the film industry the right of the film actress to be able to assert herself as a creative artist and as a worker that is a huge industrial cultural struggle that that i kind of unpack in the book um and then link to that the vulnerabilities of that worker figure uh because of a steady and constant undermining of her status as as an artist and a professional which also makes her open to various kinds of harassment including sexual harassment in the workplace and i discuss one of those um, cases um in in chapter 6 so definitely again same same different different continuities resonances that are both disturbing uh though much has changed also in terms of the financial and cultural prestige and power of the bollywood actress today but also something interesting in the 1930s where actresses really had top billing and were getting paid way more than their male counterparts which is something that seems very shocking to us in an age across hollywood and bollywood where the fight is also for parity of pay uh, when actually in the 30s it was the actress that was uh, undeniably the financial engine um, of the cine ecology and had to be recognized monetarily as such at the upper most echelons so the the female stars not of course background dancers um uh junior artists and so on okay i think we're going to have to wrap up here uh i just want to thank you so much um speaking as uh, somebody who works works on south asia but not specializing at all in in the specific topic that you're thinking about um uh i just found that your book I think is a really important way of disrupting the dichotomizing conceptual frameworks that we're often trapped in um and offers methodologies that will um 
really go well beyond the specific topics that you're um, you're addressing in the book. Uh, a kind of amazingly, to me, from my lens, an amazingly rigorous Deleuzian kind of view of assemblages, flows, energies that is really instantiated in ways that I think can be a model for um, work on all kinds of um, topics. So thank you so much. Thank you um, for all of your uh, input. Nipa uh, really gave us a sense of the book and for those uh, who are not yet here and your great questions. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here, for all your wonderful smiles that I can see. Uh, David, hi. Uh, and great questions and comments. And I think I'm gonna take the day off and just weep tears of, of joy <laughs> for all the, all the lovely uh, engagement with the book, I think, which is more than what every author really craves. So thank you. Thank you for being present in the middle of a pandemic and for engaging with, with my book. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye to you all. Bye. Bye.